she says, Trayvon, she hears Trayvon say, why are you following me? And that's when she says she hears a other voice say, what are you doing around here? And again, Trayvon says, why are you following me? And that's when she says, again, he said, what are you doing around here? And she says, she, Trayvon is pushed. And the reason she concludes he's pushed is because she says his voice kind of changes like something interrupted his speech. That was Benjamin Crump, the head attorney for the family of Trayvon Martin, revealing today the latest development in the case. It turns out Trayvon Martin was on his cell phone with his girlfriend while he was being pursued by George Zimmerman. Joining me now, Congressman Corrine Brown, Democrat of Florida, where this incident happened, and Jasmine Rand, one of Mart the Martin family's attorneys and an adjunct professor for the Florida A&M University. Uh, Attorney Rand, uh, what, what is the importance of this new development uh, with this ear witness? She, she uh, didn't see anything, but she heard everything through her cell phone, uh, everything that was happening to Trayvon. I mean, I think the importance of this, this new witness is that it's corroborative testimony. In the law, it's very important that you have your witness testimony corroborating. She says what every other witness has said, that, that Trayvon was not the aggressor and that Zimmerman was actively pursuing Trayvon. Congresswoman Brown, uh, you were on the show last night. You said you ha were going to have a meeting with the Justice Department today. How did that go? I think it went very well. We met with the mayor of um, Sanford and uh, the city manager and the Justice Department for over an hour. And um, I got the feeling that we are moving in the right direction. It was very important to get the Justice Department involved along with the state and local because basically I don't feel up to, up to this point that everything has been handled the way it should have been handled. Well, a lot of things haven't been done uh, by the local police, including talking to witnesses. There's another witness uh, I want to listen to now. Uh, on the Orlando Sentinel website, uh, this is where this videotape comes from, uh, they have this interview of a 13-year-old boy who did witness part of this uh, event. Let's, let's watch this and listen to this. I heard screaming when I walked outside, so I went to where I heard it, and it was behind about 20 to 25 yards from behind my house and I looked and I saw someone laying on the ground and I heard someone yelling for help and then my dog he got off the leash and I went to go grab him and then when I grabbed my dog I heard a shot and right when I heard the shot the screaming stopped so I went inside and I told my sister and she called 911. The police arrived and I later found out that the person who got shot died. I think, I'll think about what if I went, went over there if the person still would have got shot. No, I just think that Sometimes people get stereotyped and I fit into this stereotype as the person who got shot. Congressman Brown, there's a 13-year-old constituent of yours who's thinking tonight, what could I have done? Maybe if I went over there, maybe the shooting wouldn't have happened. He's also worried tonight that he fits the stereotype of the kind of person that George Zimmerman was looking for. Well, clearly, um, it, it's just very dangerous, uh, very endangered speeches, a species of black male, you know, walking on the sidewalk. Now, this is America, and we're better than this, and we've got to do better, and this is not acceptable. Clearly, he was profiled, um, and how this case has been handled. It's got to be a teaching moment for us. We've got to learn from this, and we've got to put procedures in place that we're all comfortable that this is not going to happen again.
I want us all and the audience especially to listen to this new portion of the 911 tape that was revealed today. Uh, most people have heard the rest of this tape, but I, I want to give the audience a heads up. Uh, it gets profane. Uh, George Zimmerman uses the F word very clearly. There's absolutely no dispute about that. He says effing. And it's the word after that. And, and you, the, the network has kind of bleeped out the word effing, and so it's a little bit hard to hear the flow into the next word. Uh, but the next word is the big word that's at issue here. Uh, the, this is the part of the, the transcript where the dispatcher is going to say to him, OK, what in, entrance is it that he's heading towards? Zimmerman says the back entrance. Then there's a pause. Then there's effing. And then there's a word. And he's, he's calling... Uh, he's calling Trayvon this word. Okay. Uh, and, and I want everyone to listen to it. Uh, everyone in the audience will play it more than once. I want everyone to make their own judgment about what they're hearing. Let's listen to that tape now. Okay. Which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. <laughs> Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. All right, I just want to let the audience hear it one more time. I, I've listened to it for a few times. I, I, the first time I heard it, I recognized that the second word easily. Uh, I want to let the audience hear it one more time, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, which entrance is that that he's heading towards? The back entrance. <laughs> Are you following him? Yeah. Okay, we don't need you to do that. Jasmine Randa, what do you hear him saying? I hear him saying effing coons. Congresswoman Brown? I didn't hear what he said, but what I heard was the, the uh, dispatcher told him to stand down. We don't need you to follow him. They're on the way. That's what I heard. Uh, there was no reason for him to engage this young man whatsoever. He clearly was the aggressor. Attorney Rand, I heard what you heard, and I heard it repeatedly. I've played it repeatedly. Uh, there are people who are saying, uh, when they hear this, they hear the word punks. I know people are saying that with honesty. I think to some extent it depends on what computer you're listening to it on. But let's get to your interpretation of it legally. Though those two words, the adjective, the, the effing, and then uh, saying the word that, that you've attributed to, uh, uh, to George uh, Zimmerman, it seems to me constitutes obvious evidence of hateful intent. This is a racial slur that you're hearing him say minutes, seconds possibly, before he shoots a black teenager to death for having done absolutely nothing. Well, I mean, I think, I think as you said, the racial overtones to me, um, they couldn't be ignored to begin with. And certainly, you know, after I went back and, and, and analyzed what I heard too, I didn't hear it the first time, but I, uh, I certainly went back and listened to it several times now. And, and that's what I hear. And I think that the, the racial overtones are, are prevalent throughout this entire case, beginning with some statements that the neighborhood has made, which are significant to me. And what a lot of the neighbors have said is, yes, that's what we do. Uh, we look for young black men to be criminals on this property. And that's exactly what George Zimmerman did that night. Trayvon was not a criminal. He was a kid walking home from a convenience store with a pack of Skittles and an iced tea. And what George Zimmerman did was, was identify him as a young black male who he believed was suspicious because of his skin color and followed him to see whether or not he was going to commit any type of criminal activity. I think, you know, Zimmerman's language, uh, the, the effing coons is what I heard. He also referred to Trayvon as, or said that these a-holes always get away. And he uh, identified Trayvon as black twice in that video. So to me, you know, that last bit where what I hear is, is Evan Coons is very significant and we can no longer ignore that this was a racially vote motivated crime. Congressman Brown, uh, I've studied police cover-ups in the past and written about them. And when I heard that tape today and when I interpreted it the way Attorney Rand interpret interpreted it, 
I believe that what we have here is evidence of a police cover-up. This is not conclusive legal proof of a police cover-up, but this is evidence that the police, that local police department, never wanted anyone to hear those two words. And that's why we haven't heard those two words until today. Well, one of the things I wanted was to release the tapes so that you could hear it. And, and I also wanted the Justice Department to come in so we could get an independent review of what has happened from step by step. And that is what has happened. The fact that you see those tapes and you can hear those tapes and they're out there so you can analyze those tapes was very important to me. Congresswoman Corrine Brown and Attorney Jasmine Rand, we're not finished with this case. I'm sure we'll have you both back. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.